originating from the podcast studio inside FAM 360's headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia. This is the Above and Beyond Leadership Podcast. The Above and Beyond Leadership Podcast is designed to encourage, equip, and inspire our audience through a combination of inspirational stories and real life experiences shared by other successful and skilled leaders in a variety of vocations. We hope that the Above and Beyond Leadership Podcast empowers each one of us to step out, step up, and ultimately thrive as leaders. Now here's our host, Mr. Matt Maloney. Hello, 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 podcast land, and welcome back to the Above and Beyond Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Mr. Matt Maloney. I am pumped maybe a little bit nervous even actually, but I am pumped today to introduce uh, our guest to you. She is, you know, we were thinking, I was thinking about this, like how can I describe her, but I'm just going to call it girl boss is what I'm going to describe her as. She is a total girl boss. Uh, One of the first, uh, she's not the first female on, but she's one of the first female or she, she's the first female entrepreneur on the podcast that we've had. And, uh, she has literally blazed a trail, um, to, uh, success in her career and her vocation, which we're going to learn a lot about today. Very impressive, uh, a, really a cool journey that I'm excited to, to share with you and have her share with you today, but she's blazed that trail starting, starting out as a, um, uh, what did you call it? Editing? What is Wardrobe. it? Stylist. Wardrobe stylist, starting out as that, uh, then becoming a, uh, having massive success as a social media influencer, uh, and then just recently launching her own boutique called Lauren Lilly. So before I introduce her, I thought this quote by Sarah Blakely was really, really perfect. And she's totally a girl boss. I love Sarah Blakely. I follow her. She's awesome. It says, don't be intimidated by what you don't know. That can be your greatest strength and ensure that you do things differently from everyone else. So now, without further ado, please welcome Lauren LaFever. Hi, I love that quote. Is that awesome? That's awesome. And yeah. Sarah Blakely is one of my girl boss heroes, and I've never heard that quote from her. Yeah, so that's that's awesome. She's that Instagram. I, I, I follow Sarah, and I'm, I'm always like, of course, her, that her famous, like, I, I guess, you know, her little coffee mug quotes, you know, or whatever. And she's, I don't know, she's just been great. I knew someone that worked with her in a leadership role in her organization early on, and uh, he always used to just share just really great stories about her. Like how That's just all I awesome hear she as works. Well. Yeah. Yeah. So, awesome. so, you know, I thought we'd start off with a little bit, like just to kind of set the tone. So the audience gets to know a little bit about you. Just talk about, you know, where did you grow up, your upbringing? Um, how did you get to Georgia? And then we can talk about what kind of uh, maybe leading segue, what kind of gave you this spark inside of you to start your your own business, not not where you're at now, but initially the the, the wardrobe editing. Um, so I grew up actually in Johns Creek, where we were basically are now and where I live now, which is cra- crazy. I was born in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, lived in, grew up in Hilton Head, South Carolina, which was a cool place to grow up until oh. I was about six. We still vacation there every year, cool. kind of there next week. And then moved to Atlanta when I was six, uh, went to UGA, got married, moved to Austin, Texas. That'll come into my story in a little bit. Okay. Um, and then came back to the Johns Creek area. So born and bred for basically a Georgia Bell or a Southern Bell. Yeah. Georgia Peach. Georgia Peach. Georgia That's right. Peach. Yeah. Um, and honestly, growing up, I've always, my, my parents are both entrepreneurial, hard workers, and growing up, I always just had a knack for style and starting businesses. If you ask my mom, she would tell you about all the things I tried to sell her women's Bible study that would meet at our, our home, all the jewelry <laughs> I would design. I had Lauren's Irresistible Creations when I was seven or eight with business what? card. Oh, there it is, so it's right there. it's not that surprising to my family that I now just launched my own boutique. Um, That's awesome. But I always had a knack for wardrobe and fashion. And one of my favorite stories is when we we built a house in Johns Creek in a newer neighborhood at the time. And though I had a pretty lucrative babysitting career in the neighborhood because I was like the only girl my age um, at 15 or so. And a lot of the women then would ask me if they could pay me $8 an hour to take them shopping and help them pick out clothes. And now I'm laughing because these women are like my age now. Wait, so you were 15. Yes. 
I they was were like 35 year olds, 30 year olds. Yeah. Like you were taking them or they were taking you. They were you, taking me. But, they were driving but, me to the shopping yeah, mall. Trying on, to the mall. <laughs> I was putting together That's outfits awesome. and that kind of just created in me this knack for, man, people trust my sense of style and maybe I could do this. And so. That's incredible. That's great. So really, I mean, it started, I didn't realize that it started from at, I mean, from an early age, seven years old. Yes. Now, uh, did, did, how long did you do that? I mean, was that just kind of just haphazard? Well, not haphazard, but just uh, occasionally people would say, Hey, we want to take Lauren and go to the, sh uh, I wanna, want her to go with me to the shopping mall and find clothes or, and did the word spread like amongst your I guess, parents, friends, and neighborhood friends? Yes, it did. And that is how, when I launched my wardrobe styling company, Edit by Lauren, it was like our first, uh, after, I think we had only been married one year in two, uh, it's like back in 2008. It was literally something that came very organically. I just started to get more and more side jobs where people would say, what would you charge for me to do this or that? And um, my husband really believed in me as well. And he was like, let's just, you know, want, do this. And so... I just awesome. launched the company and it's so funny if I look back at my first little logo, we had a friend draw and this one page website with my rates and it really was exciting to see how that blossomed. What did that just, <clears throat> at a, you know, for my own edification, what did that look like? So you would go in uh, and, and by the way, do you still do some of this or not really? I don't now. Yeah. No. You're just too busy. With I really, when the influencer thing sh really took off a few years ago, I had to shut this down. I still get requests all the time from Google searches and I, part of me would love to, I just yeah, you just don't have the time to right, do it, right? right. They're not the bandwidth. So, but what did that look like? So people would, would have you come in, um, go into their closets essentially. And I mean, just walk, walk the audience yes. through that. So what I loved is, you know, you think of only celebrities have stylists. Yeah. And what I really wanted to do is help the everyday woman. And, and I actually wound up working also with teenagers and with men, but I wanted the every, every, every woman to feel the best. I used to say that um, I wanted to help every woman feel her best regardless of her size um, or budget and, or lifestyle. And so I worked with a lot, everyone from stay at home moms to Braves wives. Um, I even got to be on, um, one of my fun stories is I got hired by the ABC biggest loser to style these oh. people that have lost like 300 pounds Yeah, and they had an unlimited budget at Nordstrom. I could put them whatever for their finale show and get to see them literally oh, cry in the dressing amazing. room where they felt you know, like a totally brand new person. Anyways, that's so, so I would go into people's homes and then I would take them shopping and put together a curated list of what they need, help them figure out what to get rid of, what to keep, and then really help them. And this is something that I still love doing on my influencer platform. And what I also want to do with my new boutique is, is help everyone know how to utilize pieces in their wardrobe and mix and match. That's sure. like a... A, a, a big thing that I just love to infuse into people is, and especially yeah. women, don't just buy this one thing and wear it one way. Let's figure out four or five ways to wear that. Yeah. And I mean, I've like, got that problem. Hello. <laughs> like, I'm like, okay, I buy this. I mean, look, the traditional, like for male, you know, outfit, whatever, a golf Much shirt simpler. or this, but, but it's, it, it's simpler, but I still, I'm like, I still struggle with, in my mind, like, okay, well, gosh, I know there's another way I can wear yeah, that, but yeah. how, what should we get I wear stuck that? in a rut? You always yeah. wear this shirt with these pants. And yeah. Cause that's like what I know. That's what I feel comfortable yeah. in. But the reality of it is there's, there's probably six different options that I can do with that. Right, right. Right. That's cool. So that really, I mean, your journey, and I want to talk about the journey. I mean, mm -hmm. it started seven years old, 15, you start going in shopping with, you know, 30 somethings, right. Yep. To then starting this, this editing business, mm -hmm. which obviously had massive success. And, and you said your husband, I think I heard you say that, that, uh, your husband, Mike, Mike. yep. Yes. Uh, he encouraged you in this, in this process. I mean, what did that look like? Because, you know, behind every entrepreneur is a great spouse that's supporting that person one way that what, what did that look like what, was he like i don't know lauren like editing you know wardrobes is that going to really work or was there ever a doubt on that or did was he always like do it let's go he's always been like do it let's go i'm more of the like <clears throat> can i do this like in the okay. back of my mind and I, I was telling telling some of your staff behind uh while we were eating before this just that like i think i'm 
part of probably what has made me driven successful is that I'm always a, like a little bit skeptical sure. of myself and like the glass is half empty, Yeah. but it also like pushes me to be like, but let's try. Let's go. And so yeah. Mike's more of like, <laughs> he's always really believed in me and been like, you've got it. You've got what it takes. Just do it. And I think when we first Huge. started, uh, Mike was in ministry. We had like no money. We didn't have kids. And so to start a business was a scary endeavor because I had to quit my job, even though I didn't make much, it was stable. Yeah. And and you know, take a job that was literally like on a hiring hour by hour basis. Mm. And so now looking back, I'm really proud that I'm, I'm thankful that he pushed me to do that. And I'm proud that I took that, le that leap of faith instead of staying what was safe. Yeah, um, that's great. Yeah, I was just talking about this as you're talking about that. I'm thinking in my mind on a prior podcast, we were talking about um, this individual. My guest was talking about when he got recruited into this company that he was in, he had, um, who was the owner of the company, was speaking into him and really just encouraging him and, and really telling him simply like, hey, you are really good at this. You have this, like I'm telling you, you may not see it, but you have it and I'm supporting you. And eventually this guest became the owner of that company. He That's bought awesome. this guy out, but it, it really stemmed from a belief that was instilled in him by this individual who owned the company at the time to believe in himself and be willing to take the risk mm -hmm. to step out and step up, which is exactly what I heard you just say mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. Mike did with you, Totally, which is so cool. Uh, I love I'm that. Very grateful for that. So you go from, um, you know, wardrobe editing to influencer, right? And, and influencer, I don't even know how long that terminology has been around, right? I don't know, maybe 10 years, maybe, maybe it used less to be blogger and now it's influencer. Right. So how did that come to be? Like, it, it sounds like that that may have happened organically a little bit, but I don't know. So tell the audience, how did you become an influencer? I love this story, especially it, it dates me. I'm like the OG influencer in Atlanta for sure. Um, but we, <laughs> when my, now it's like everyone's an influencer and every 18 year old right, wants right. to be an influencer. And I'm like, right. I'm 41 and I've been doing this a while and yeah. I've seen so many many changes in the industry, but I am proud about the organic way that it, that it came about. So, um, in 2011, we had one year old twins. They were not even one. We, my husband got a, a job opportunity in Austin. It was kind of a bucket list city. We thought, let's, let's go try it. We've heard Austin's great. Yeah. We kept our house here, rented it, moved, moved to the center of Austin, rented this cute little bungalow in this downtown Austin, which was a total culture shock, but such a fun yeah. place to live. Cool place. And you know, everyone there is an entrepreneur. And yeah. this uh, guy that was actually renting a house behind our house, um, he w went to our church, this cool young guy, and he was like super interested in my wardrobe styling business, which by the way, at that point I had expanded to Austin and to Nashville at the time. Okay. So when we lived in Austin, I was commuting back to Atlanta about um, once a month, taking on a weekend of clients and then had a lot of success setting up my business in Austin. So I wasn't looking to make a pivot. It yeah. was good and yeah. I was able to manage it okay with, with young kids because I could go for a few hours, yeah. have a client come back, et cetera. So this guy named Taylor, I don't even know where he is in the world now, but I owe him. But thank my, you, Taylor. <laughs> thank you, Taylor. Um, he was like, Lauren, there's this new social media platform my company is talking all about, it's called Instagram. It had literally just launched. And this wait, what year was that? 2011. Again? 2011. Okay. Yeah. I always think, cause my twins were born in 2010. So this is 11. And I was, he was like, it's all about your outfit of the day. And so I literally started, I'll never forget we had this little front yard in downtown Austin. And I would walk outside in the blazing heat of summer. And I would just take a downward selfie of whatever I was wearing that, you know, if it was something cute yeah. together, like mom style of one year old twins. And I just started to tag the companies that were in my picture and put it out there um, on Instagram. And I literally remember hearing from friends back home, what are you doing? Like people weren't following me. I think my friends thought this is really weird. Like, <laughs> no one, you, it's hard to imagine, but no one documented their outfits. Like right, I had right, a blog. Right. And my blog was simply to share like a J Crew sale. Here's what to get with pictures of models. People weren't modeling yeah, themselves. Right. So I'm sure it sounded kind of maybe seemed arrogant to right, people I knew. Right. But um, I started to document that. And I come like a month later, a local boutique in Austin was like, we'll give you some free shirts if you advertise them. I'm like, people are giving me something for free. I'll um, take it. Let's it go. Awesome. And so I did have my best friend in Austin is a super talented photographer. And then she started to shoot small campaigns. And we moved back to Atlanta 
two years, less than two years later, we were in Austin for exactly two years, moved back to Atlanta. Literally the month we got back, I got a call from Old Navy and Gap Corporate and Lily Pulitzer Corporate. I had 3,000 followers. That's all I had, which is nothing now. Right. And they both signed me to a year contract for more money than I ever envisioned making in anything like this. And that was really that aha moment of like, man, I am onto something. And really people weren't doing it. I didn't feel like I had much competition, especially being a mom. And so that was, that was like a real pivotal moment. And then coming back to Atlanta, I think was huge because I really led the way in the, as an Atlanta influencer. Now I'm like a peon to all these girls that have like millions of followers around town. But at the time I was like the Atlanta influencer and it opened up a world of opportunity around the city. That's incredible that it's, you know, it's, you know, this is a God story to yes. me. It's oh, totally, it's incredible just how organically that all happened. Um, and, and really, again, it goes back to how you were designed seven years old, mm-hmm. 15 years old, you start the, the, the wardrobe editing business, then just you decide, Hey, I'm going to start taking a pic. You know, your friend comes and talks to you. Was it Taylor that talked to you Taylor, about that? Yeah. Yes. That, that talked to you about the you know Instagram, this new social media platform. You take some pictures. People are saying, what are you doing? Are you crazy? Is yeah. this a little weird? It definitely had but opposition, you, but you had opposition. You stayed with it. You're like, you know what? I, I don't know. It just feels right. I'm just mm-hmm. going to keep doing mm-hmm. it. And, uh, just that's, that's a great story and inspiring to our audience in a big way. And I'll just add too, and this is like sometime I'd like to write a book, but way too much to get into this, but that, that chapter of our life was our hardest for our family, our marriage. There was a lot, a lot, a lot behind the scenes of his opposition. And one thing that I'm super proud about, and I haven't even shared, like at some point I want to share, not necessarily on the podcast. But yeah. You know, right. At some point venue. you're, yeah. But, but that's something that I, I think has fueled me to of being proud, if that's the right word of my, or, and I guess maybe proud of myself, but also fueled me that I can do things even when things, when times are really, really hard. Yeah. Um, and if you keep that like mantra of like, you know, if I work hard and I believe in, it sounds cliche, I believe in myself, but I always had true sure. leaders around me, even yeah. when things were hard. Sure. You have and to. And that pushed me through. And so I never, I say all that because I never, ever want to be like, oh, and look, then these things just happened to her. And there were like, there was a lot. When I look back, I'm like, I don't even know how all that came together. So total credit to God yeah. and to family being supportive. And well, and I think, and, and I believe this to be so true that at the center of every, and, and, and whether people, you know, are Christians and believe in God or don't, but at the mm-hmm. center of every story that I hear like that, where there's success is that I believe the heart is, I mean, your heart was in it. I mean, it mm-hmm. was, it's the heart that's driving you. You were passionate about it. And, and dis, despite what maybe if there was struggle or there was naysayers in your head or whatnot, your heart continued to lead you towards that because that's what ultimately you were destined to do. Yes. Yes. It felt very like if, the, if you were created to do something and you feel like you're living yeah. out of your passion, it's gonna, it's gonna come out regardless of how hard everything else is around you. Awesome. 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 Good stuff. So influencer, uh, three, you, you kind of left off, you know, 3000. Then of course you grew that to now at 115, whatever yep. thousand it is right now today. So in that influencer share with the audience a little bit about what does that influencer business look like now in, in terms of, uh, I don't know if you can, if you're even allowed to mention brands or I guess you can, cause it's yeah, out there, yeah. but the brands that you work with and, and that continues to go on because the next chapter is, is that you've launched this new business, yep. this boutique that we'll, we'll talk about in a second, but share that with the audience. Yeah. So I started just really trying to pivot, pivoting my love of style and fashion into, you know, it was a style blog and a fashion Instagram solely at first. So like I mentioned, some of the first brands I worked with were Old Navy, Gap, Lily Pulitzer, Nordstrom was a big one, Anthropology, Free People, which was so fun to me because these are like my favorite brands ever that I was yeah. styling myself and others in. Yeah, you and loved them anyways. They were hiring me for campaigns. And um, so just a little background, influencers kind of get paid by commissions. So you click or your wife clicks on my Free People dress and buys it, I get a percentage of that. Yep. And then also flat rate campaigns. And that's really how that's really how it becomes lucrative is, you know, uh, Nordstrom says, okay. They put you under a contract basically yes. and say this. This is business. what it is. Yeah. And- and um, back at the time, it was like, you need a blog post, you need a Facebook post, Pinterest and Instagram. Now it's mainly just like Instagram. 
That's it. Just do Instagram and Instagram reels and they don't even care so much about the blog. And I started to want to do like some home renovations and stuff like that. I started to pivot more into lifestyle and a fun story is, um, you know, Home Depot is located here, the, the headquarters in Atlanta. And somehow one of their people on their team followed me and they were getting ready to launch like their home decor line. I don't know, maybe six years ago, um, five or six years ago. And they hired me as their first fashion uh, influencer to launch that line. And they did two commercial productions in our home. And they hired one of my favorite designers, Brian Patrick Flynn, who's a total doll. So Mm -hmm. he and I got to work Mm -hmm. on designing rooms in my house. And that pivoted me then into doing more home stuff. Uh, After that point, I started to work with brands like Frontgate and Serena and Lily, um, Joss and Main and Wayfair and all these brands. And that opened up again. It's like these pivotal moments where like Home Depot finds me. I don't pursue them. Yeah. So, so cool. They give me the opportunity. And then all of a sudden people are like, what's your home stuff? And I think, I think what's made me likable or followable to a lot of the mainstream is that everything I've done has not been like our homes have never been over the top. So I think people can feel like relatable, relatable. It's relatable relatable. to people. And so doing all this, it's like my following has like grown up with me. Yeah. Um, and I always love to tell people, I'm like, I don't have the biggest following, but I have very loyal following. And a lot of these people have followed me literally since the beginning. Yeah. It's not the quantity. It's the quality. quality. We talk about that a lot in our business about the quality and that's what it is. Yes. So my 20 year old following or 28 year old when I was starting are now in their forties like me and you know, they can buy these things or doing the similar things to their home and this or that. And so now also I work a lot like some of my favorite brands to work with are Toyota and Lexus. We do a lot of travel campaigns with them, Ritz Carlton, different, different hotel chains. Yeah, what, what, um, I'm curious, like, what do you do with the hotel chains? What does that look like? So a lot of times I'm invited to a new property or a property I haven't been to, okay. or just to do like, I usually work with like the Ritz Carlton, like Coney once a year, we'll take yeah. our family and just yeah. kind of like showcase that. Yep. Um, one of our favorite things has been to do Disney and like the work with the four scenes that's in Orlando yeah, and sure. showcase different things. So that's been really fun as the kids have gotten older because our whole family gets to kind of enjoy the perks yeah. of, of my work with that. That's cool. Little plug for Rich Carlton Lake Oconee, Reynolds Lake Oconee. I still think it's probably the best, or if it's not the best, it's one of the best like family friendly resorts I've been to anywhere in this country. Totally. It's awesome. It, it's not far away if you're in Atlanta and it feels like a total respite and there's something for everyone to do to relax. And yeah. you're just like enclosed in this safe little property where you feel like awesome. now my kids can just kind of run around and we can lay by the pool and they can do the lake and fishing and yeah. oh, we love it. In the influencer you know, part of your career and you look at how that's changed and evolved, you know, from 13 or from 11, I guess is Mm -hmm, really mm -hmm. when that kind of really started because Instagram was being from 11 until today. What are some of the things that, um, that you've seen that have changed that either have made it more difficult or just made it different? I mean, what, what are some of the things that you've seen that, that, that how that's evolved, uh, both, I guess, maybe positive or negative? Yeah. I mean, the positive has been is that I'm thankful I've been able to stay in it this long yeah. and and a lot of brands have stayed very loyal through, the, you know, I have some really long standing brand relationships that I love, um, but it has been hard. And I think there's more negatives than positives in the sense of like, now everyone there's the, the market is very oversaturated. So somebody like me that feels like I've been doing this forever. I've seen so many people that just whiz past me in numbers. And if yeah. that's what you're going on, you can't compete. You know, I, yeah. I'm, I feel confident and in, in my people and that they're purchased and I have great conversion rates, but I yeah. can't, I can't compete if you have someone that's 2 million followers, followers you know? Right. Yeah. Um, so it's become oversaturated. And so that's made it a little bit more difficult to get in with, you know, certain campaigns. Sure. And then also just Instagram is ever changing. And so the logarithms, and then this or that, it's very difficult right now to grow. Oh. There were times, uh, remember when I was first starting out, I would go to New York Fashion Week every every year and you know we'd all tag each other, all the influencers there. And you'd wake up and have 2,000 followers overnight. And now like I, it's a struggle to maybe gain that in six months. Right, sure. Of true, you know, I'm not, I don't buy my followers. So yeah, like, right. Yeah, of true, true, just, they, they just, panic, yeah. It's very hard and it's yeah. hard to get your, you know, I used to, it's crazy. I look back at pictures from two years ago that have more likes than they do now. And it's simply because of Instagram and logarithm and no one knows, it's like this mystery code that no one knows Nobody, how to figure yeah, out. Yeah, right, yeah. And so that's frustrating to create great content and then yeah. not know it's a crapshoot. Is it going to be seen or not seen? So one a piece of advice, and I would say this to anyone out there that has has a desire to create an Instagram or any kind of influencer is don't forget about the blog. 
one of the best pieces of advice I got early on with an agency I work with, they did a conference each year and they, I remember one of the speakers said, at the end of the day, all you own is your blog and website. You don't yeah. own Facebook or Instagram. And I've seen so many influencers lose their accounts or this or that. And so uh, what I've tried to do over the years is, uh, you know, I don't blog every day, but to keep that going. So like if my Instagram were to go down, people know how to find me and sure. that's still out there. Cause at the end of the day, that's, that's a good point. That's my only thing. It has everything from all the years. You control that. Right? I control it. Yeah. Yes. So that's, that's good. That's great advice. So you, you, you know, you've been on this journey. Um, you've had, you know, you've blazed this trail, really a trailblazer, right? I mean, by definition, you know, 2011 Instagram launches, you launch, it's very organic. You go, it, yeah, obviously it's evolved. The industry's evolved uh, on that side of it. And then as you've, you know, as you started to transition, you had this, obviously the yearning to start your own boutique boutique. Mm -hmm. So talk to the audience about that. How did that happen? How did that come to pass? So as much as I love like working on brand collaborations and partnerships all the time, it still doesn't always feel like my business. It is my business, but I think the entrepreneur in me just always wants to create. And so <laughs> yeah. I'm like never satisfied with that. And so a long time dream that I've had is to have my own, you know, boutique and line and lifestyle brand. And again, this has been something that only fear has really kept me from not doing it sooner and busyness. Like it's, I think I, I think I let busyness, I had this idea and literally had the name Lauren Lilly and bought the domain like four years ago. Sure. And I hired my graphic designer and web team over a year ago. And I've been sitting on the website now for like eight months. And I finally just launched two weeks ago. And although I'm so happy that I'm launched and the timing is great, I, now I look back, I'm like, why didn't I do this sooner? Yeah, right. Um, but it's born out of, I think a desire when I, especially when I turned 40, I'm 41 now, I realized like, you know, when I'm 50, what do I want to be doing? I think I'll always be the person that I want to be creating and, and working to an extent or yeah. overseeing some project, but I don't want to be always having to like take that outfit of the day picture. And I can't imagine at 50, like wanting to work with so many different brands. I want yeah. to have my own thing. Yep. And then I have 11 year old daughter. So Lily. that was part of your vision really is to, is, as, a, as you're transitioning towards that yes. is like, I want to have my own brand. I mean, yes, long I term, yeah. long term. I want to create something yeah. that in my 50 retirement years, so to speak, I can oversee and be a visionary and yeah. not be, you know, I work really hard during the week and I don't want to be, you know, I want to work myself out of that, that long yeah. term, even sure. though I love what I do. I don't want to be doing this exact thing in, in sure. the next 10 years. Yep. Um, and then having a daughter that I can kind of like, hopefully she's excited about it now. Hopefully she'd love to help <laughs> run this one day or work with me. So that's where it's born. And I, I think that. with that, again, it's like, I have all these dreams of eventually I'd love to get into home decor and clothes and this or that. And I had to really like funnel that down to where's a good starting point. And I started with just accessories. It's, it's accessible accessories really fit my styling background where I always tell women yeah. accessories always fit regardless. If you feel like you're 10 pounds heavy, they always make you feel lovely. You can yep. wear them at any age. And so, and I'm like self-proclaimed accessory queen. So I'm starting with an accessory line that's curated. I'm designing a lot of pieces. Love it. And then hopefully over time, my vision is to, to expand and grow that. That's great. Pivot, so that's, that's like, that's good stuff right there. I love that. Well, we have uh, unfortunately run short on time for this episode, but the cool thing is, is we get to pick it up on the next episode, learn a little bit more about um, Lauren's vision, where she's going with Lauren Lilly. We're going to learn a little bit about her family and also some, um, some personal tidbits and secrets about how she continues to lead in her life and her family life and balance all this together. So uh, thank you. For thank being you on. for having me. Yeah, it's been awesome. And to all the listeners out in podcast land, thanks again for joining the Above and Beyond Leadership Podcast. I hope that your days are filled with opportunity to empower and inspire others and continue to lead well as we go out and try to lead above and beyond. Thanks, guys. Our executive producer and host is Matt Maloney, president and CEO of FAM360. Strategic communication coordinator, Michelle Decato. Production assistance by Tin Dog Studios, director John Roland, creative assistant Whitney Roland. Theme song, Connecting Dots by Curtis Cole, provided by Artlist. Please subscribe today and don't miss any of our weekly episodes.